I'm going to be talking about something slightly unusual. It's plant iridescence. Now, usually when people think about plants, they think about the fact that leaves, by and large, are green. I'm going to be talking about plants that are not just green, but can also be blue. And this can look a bit strange, and it's a bit of a... Well, initially, when I started looking at iridescence, it's one of these like, is it just incredibly... Um, just in one or two plants, we're finding it's actually a lot more common than we ever suspected. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we've continued looking at this, because it might have a range of different functions. OK, so first of all, let's start with the basics. There will be a little bit of physics in this, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of other things too. It's not just plants, but I've tried to keep the physics on that side in such a way that hopefully it will be accessible to everyone. So please don't be scared. So first of all, iridescence, what is it? It's structural colour. It's a form of structural colour. So if you have a look at the chairs you're sitting on, on the clothes you're wearing, most of them are a colour. Usually that is due to pigments. So a pigment is where um, a chemical compound within that material will absorb all of the wavelengths apart from the wavelengths it reflects. And those wavelengths are then the wavelengths that if your eye can perceive them, you will actually perceive as a particular shade of colour. Now, iridescence is a special form of structural colour. You can have structural colour that isn't iridescent. Um, but iridescence is a structural colour that changes hue with varying observation, um, observational angle. So if you pick up an, an iridescent object, such as an opal, or if you look at a bubble moving through the air, you'll see that as it moves, or as you move in relation to it, it will change colour. So it's a special type of structural colour. Now, there's always been a certain amount of fascination with iridescence. So, for example, Hooke and Newton started looking at iridescence when they first looked at the microscope and looked at peacock feathers and the iridescence that is produced there. And there's been a lot of work done on animal iridescence. Um, so if we know about peacocks, we know about the morpho butterfly, about beetles. And this is actually an area of um, science that's been developed as an area called biomimetics, where you can look at, for example, the structural colour in peacocks or beetles or butterflies, and you can use the information about how those structures are produced to then replicate a similar material that then has similar properties to that biological material. However, iridescence isn't just found in animals. It's actually also found in plants, and it's actually found in a range of different uh, plant uh, tissues. It's found in leaf tissues, which is what I'm going to be talking about, but it's also quite widespread in floral tissues as well, although a lot of that iridescence is in the more ultraviolet range of the wavelengths, which is why we can't see it as well. But pollinators that can see uh, ultraviolet can see that. So again, Iridescence might be quite widespread in plants, in flowers, but because we can't see it, we haven't noticed it, um, and so it's not you know, widely known. I'm not going to talk about flowers, I'm going to talk about leaves. So here are three examples of plant iridescence in three very different groups of plants, begonias, selaginella, and elaphoglossum, which is a fern. I'll go back to all of those in a bit. This is just, an, just to show you some of the diversity of plant iridescence. So I've mentioned selaginella, which is let's see if this, um, a uh, lycophyte or this is, ah, yes, a, one of the sort of lycophytes or lower plants, uh, non-flowering plants, as are ferns. And then you also find iridescence in both the dicots in begonia and in the monocots. And obviously in flowering plants, you also have flowers which show structural colour and iridescence there too. You also find iridescence in quite a range of different algae and seaweeds, both uh, red algae and brown algae, but I'm not going to discuss the algae at all today. I'm going to stick with, with plants for now. Okay, so there's been a lot of... I've mentioned that there's been a lot of work done on iridescence in animals, but much, much less is known about iridescence in plants. One of the reasons for this is getting hold of the tissue to study the iridescence. Iridescence in animals 
can be much more easily studied because the iridescence remains there even after the animal is dead. So if you go to somewhere like the Natural History Museum or to basically any museum that has a natural history collection, you can look through there, beetles, butterflies and all the rest of it. And even if those samples are 100 years old, the iridescence is still there and it is still measurable. This is not the case in plant iridescence. Part of the um, reason that um, it, plant iridescence is a bit different is actually the iridescence is made up of very much living tissue that then goes once the plant dies. So that's one reason that um, plant iridescence hasn't been studied because you can't bring sort of pressed samples back from your travels around the world and study them 10 years later as you can with animals. Another reason is that um, a lot of the plants that show iridescent are really difficult to grow. So these are some of the begonia species that we grow. And um, when I first started off trying to look at iridescent plants, I spent more time killing plants than actually managing to grow them. Um, they all require really specialised conditions and they're all frankly difficult and generally awkward to grow. The third th reason why plant iridescence maybe isn't known, hasn't been studied particularly, is that even though we know that these plants are iridescent, as you can see, they really don't look it. I'll explain later on, but it's actually very difficult to know if a plant is iridescent at first look. A lot of plants that may be iridescent are only iridescent under certain conditions and if they're then looked at in the right way. Um, so this means that a lot of species that could have iridescence are, are not known to have it. So again, it's one of these things that iridescence may be more widespread than we thought. So to study iridescence, first of all, you need to grow the plants, awkward as they are. <coughs> then you need to image the colour. Now this hopefully gives you an idea of how vivid the iridescence can be. Now usually you think of plants as being green. Some of these plants, such as the Slaginella wildernovii here, can be intensely metallic blue, if you look at, them, uh, look at it from the right angle. And there's, there, there's an actually quite an, a vivid, intense colour that you can see in some of these iridescent plants. However, whereas the Slaginella, some of them have their iridescence right on the surface of the leaf, others, such as the Begonia, actually produce their iridescence <gasps> within the cell. Now this is a plant called Begonia pavonina, also known as the peacock begonia because of its vivid blue and green coloration. And you can see here that something called iridoplasts can be found in this upper epidermis. And what these are is this is actually what causes the iridescence. And what this means is that to be able to actually start looking at this structural colour, you need to image not just the leaf as a whole, but actually the individual structures that produce that colour. And you can do this by collaborating with physicists. And they can set up a spectrometer um, that can then be linked to a microscope, just a standard microscope, that you can then link to a goniometer, which means that you can measure not just the colour, but the colour from multiple different angles. Now, this is important because this is one of the defining features of iridescence, the fact that the colour changes from different angles. So in order to confirm something is structural or iridescent rather than pigment, you need to actually measure the colour from multiple different angles. And if you do that, what you can then find is that you can see whether or not what it is that's causing the iridescence. You can see here, these are the iridoplasts that you can then image using a standard light microscope and then measure that using your spectrometer linked up to your microscope to actually see that blue coloration, which has a very sharp and defined peak, which means there's a very high level of reflectance associated with that particular structure within the cell. What you can then do is you can start to image the structure that you think is responsible for producing that colour. So I'll come back to Slaginella here. And this is where the iridescence is caused by the cell wall. 
and this is caused by what we now know to be a multi-layer structure. Now you will have seen multi-layer structures before. If you've ever seen oil on water and seen that strange rainbow effect of oil on a puddle, that's exactly what we think is happening here. Multi-layers are where you have materials of two different refractive indices, two different um, in, that interact with light to two different extents, and it's the interaction between those two materials, such as oil on water, that cause this bending of light, which means that light then gets split at different angles, so you get different colours at different angles. Some plants take this multi-layer structure a bit further. Here we have two rather beautiful ferns that also produce iridescence in their structural cell wall. Um, and they actually do something rather interesting in that they use a helicoidal structure. Now, helo helicoidal structures in plant cell walls are quite common. You find them, particularly in twisting plants that grow and um, like bindweed and other plants, because that's particularly good for strength and for coiling round things. However, and if you think about a helicoidal structure is like if you had a pack of cards and you twisted it, that's a helicoidal structure and that is what is happening here in the cellulose microfibrils um, of the plant cell wall. A helicoidal structure is formed and that the order of that is such that it causes the structural colour to be reflect reflected. And what's quite nice about this helicoidal structure is that it's found, this iridescence is found from ferns all the way through to orchids, and it seems to have occurred and evolved multiple times, but we're still not entirely sure why. But you can, again, image this structure, in this case using <coughs> TEM, to actually get an idea of what the helicoidal structure is doing. I've already shown you the iridoplasts. Again, you can image these iridoplasts using TEM here and actually have a look at this structure. Now, hopefully, you can see from these iridoplasts that they are, again, stripy. And that stripy structure that hopefully you've seen in the TEMs of the cell wall um, is that, again, that multi-layer structure that I mentioned. So you've got multi-layer structures in the cell wall and also then within the cell, in these strange sort of cellular structures called iridoplasts. Now, again, you seem to have a level of convergent evolution because this is also found um, in Selaginella as well as in Begonia. And you've got these very stripy giant chloroplasts found in a species called Selaginella erythropus. <coughs> That's the iridescence there if you focus it on a light microscope and that's the structure that causes this bright blue coloration. So we've seen this in begonias, we've seen it in, uh, selagin in lycophytes. You can start to hopefully start to see that there's quite a diversity of plants that produce this iridescence, and there seems to be some sort of convergent evolution in how they do it. And here you can see what I find satinated quite interesting, because here you can see this is Selaginella wildenovii that has the cell wall iridescence that I mentioned. So the cell wall has stripes in it. And this is Selaginella erythropus, <coughs> where the structure inside the cell has stripes in it. And um, you can see that although the um, sort of, you can see different amounts of iridescence because different uh, amounts of the cell are producing the iridescence. So here you've got the whole cell wall producing the iridescence. Here you've got one part of that giant chloroplast producing the iridescence. As you can see, the wavelengths are quite similar. And this also means that um, various different members of this one group have various different ways of producing <coughs> structural colour. So, once you can image the structure, I'm going to focus more now on the begonia side of things, which is this iridoplast within the plant cell wall. Um, the iridoplast here, <coughs> you can see in the epidermal cell, an iridoplast at the bottom of the cell, this highly stripy structure. Now, when we started looking at these in begonia, it was hypothesised, well, we wondered what on earth they were. Where do you get a whole new uh, cellular organelle from? It had been hypothesised that they could be chloroplasts, but begonia's already got chloroplasts here. And if you do sort of a structural, uh, sort of a diagram of this, what you find is you've got iridoplasts just in the uh, epidermis, and then you've got 
as is normal, chloroplasts more in the mesophyll. And the begonia chloroplasts look like normal chloroplasts, and the iridoplasts look very different. So we've got two structures here that appear to have um, a, an arrangement of um, <coughs> membranes within a cellular organelle, but in two different positions within the leaf, and two different, very, you know, very different structures, ways in which those um, structures are organised. However, if you image these two things in a slightly different way, using fluorescence microscopy, which obviously you've got a beautiful um, fluorescence microscope here, <coughs> a confocal, you can actually see something interesting. Iridoplasts show confocal autofluorescence, as much as any chloroplast does. <coughs> so a, an iridoplast on the surface of this epidermis, in, in the, the top layer of the epidermis, shows this red autofluorescence of chlorophyll, the same as a standard chloroplast does. So in begonia, what you have are multiple different chloroplasts, which look really different in different parts of the <coughs> leaf with very different structures and one of those structures appears to produce an iridescent coloration. Now, this is quite useful because it means that you basically have a control for the function of iridescence within a leaf. Because what you can do is you can look at individual iridoplasts and you can use um, PAM uh, you actually use a, a way of measuring uh, photosynthesis um, to actually see the rate of photosynthesis, at how well it absorbs light, what it does with that light, and how quickly um, other um, downstream aspects of photosynthesis, how efficient they are. So you can look at individual um, sort of chloroplasts or iridoplasts and see how well they cope with light and how well they absorb light. And what you can then, and because the iridoplasts and the chloroplasts in any one leaf will have all been grown in exactly the same light conditions because they're all in the same leaf, you know that you're not dealing with a chloroplast that's been grown in a shade condition compared to a sun condition. You've basically got an in-leaf control to see whether it's the structure that is causing this difference in photosynthetic ability or whether it's um, something else to how, to, to sort of how the plant was grown or some other conditions. And what this means is that you can then compare every aspect of photosynthesis and see if it's different in a, in a, a normal chloroplast or a structurally coloured and organised chloroplast. And what you find is that for the quantum yield, which is how well the chloroplast or iridoplast absorbs light and gets light into the next step of photosynthesis, iridoplasts are actually better than normal chloroplasts. So something about the photonic, the structural, um, the, the structure of the chloroplast, which interacts with light, interacts with it in such a way that it helps light be absorbed and go on to the next stage compared to, so this is the iridoplast light absorbance and this is the mesophyll chloroplast light absorbance. So it enhances light absorption. And this is where you then go back to your physicist collaborators and say, we've got this strange result, um, why? And they can do um, modelling of your iridoplast structure. <coughs> They can model the thylakoid membranes and how ordered they are in comparison to a standard chloroplast. And they can then use um, optical models to say, OK, if we put light in, how does light interact with the material that we know the refractive index of a standard chloroplast membrane and the stroma? So we know the um, refractive index of granum and stroma within a standard chloroplast. And you get out beautiful models like this that then tells you which wavelengths could be optimised at which spacings of grana or stroma 
and so how that then impacts in how light is absorbed within a photonic structure of that degree of regularity. So these are basically the stripes that I've shown you on the TEMs of the iridoplast. So if, you, so if that was turned the other way, that would be an iridoplast stripe. And this is how light interacts with this regular striped pattern within the iridoplast. And what you find is that in iridoplast, yes, they do absorb light better, but the light they absorb better is actually the sort of light that they would actually uh, potentially obtain at the bottom of a rainforest floor, this sort of green light here. And what this means is that at very low light levels, these iridoplasts can absorb light more efficiently and more effectively than a standard chloroplast can. And when you look at where a lot of these iridescent begonias grow that have iridoplasts and the iridescent selaginellas grow, uh, selaginella erythropus, they are largely deep shade plants. So it seems to make sense. You've got a modified chloroplast that has modified its structure in such a way that it's become a photonic structure that can en enhance absorption of light and enhance absorption of light at the sort of wavelengths it's most likely to get um, in the low light shade conditions in uh, the undergrowth of a rainforest. Um, now, that's great. It sounds like an advantage. Being able to absorb more light, why don't more plants do this? Um, well, it might be that plants are, uh, iridescent plants are a lot more common. As I've mentioned before, when I was showing you trying to grow some of these plants in growth cabinets, in plants that we know to be iridescent actually frequently don't look iridescent. This is because structures like iridoplasts are like chloroplasts, they move. They are incredibly <coughs> plastic, they are dynamic. So here we have a begonia leaf. You can sort of see the bluish hint here and the bluish hint here and the greenish hint here. So what we've done here is we've put shade, um, sort of piece of paper over this bit of the leaf and a bit of shade over here. Under high light conditions, as in any other leaf, what you actually find is that the iridoplasts move sideways. So it happens again in chloroplasts. Under high light conditions, the chloroplasts will actually move out of the high light levels to avoid any photo damage. Iridoplasts do the same. So under light levels that might be damaging, the iridoplasts move from being flat against the bottom of the cell, where their iridescent structure would actually be visible, and they move sideways. They're at a completely different angle, and their iridescence isn't visible. What this means is that under the sort of light levels that we might grow plants, or we might look at plants, or see plants, or be able to see iridescence, actually plants might, even if the plant was originally iridescent, that plant might not be showing its iridescence because the iridoplasts might be to one side and therefore not visible at all. So a lot of plants might well be iridescent, but not visibly iridescent that we can see. Also, chloroplasts show plasticity. So if you grow plants under high or low light levels, you get a different degree of ordering and of sun or shade um, organisation of a chloroplast, depending on the conditions it's been grown under. And we're finding that to a lesser extent, similar, there's a similar case for iridoplasts. So iridoplasts can slightly tune their development depending on the wavelengths that they have available to them. So again, you've got different degrees of plasticity, and if they tune, if the iridoplasts tune their plasticity and their development so that that iridescence is less blue and more green, again, the iridescence is much more visible, much less visible to us. So plants that potentially are iridescent don't appear to be iridescent to our eyesight. There's another reason as well. Whereas iridoplasts are much better at absorbing light <coughs> at low light levels, in higher light levels, this incredibly ordered structure, which is an advantage as a photonic structure in sh deep, deep shade conditions, in higher light conditions, it actually becomes a bit of a problem. So under um, 
higher light conditions, what you actually find is that the iridoplast has a, a lot lower operating efficiency. So the, f the, the, the steps down the um, uh, photosynthesis pathway are actually much less efficient than in a standard chloroplast. So although this is an, still at an advantage for a shade plant, because in a shade, deep shade condition, you're trying to catch any photons that you can, any light that you can, and almost those downstream efficiency is less important because you never have enough light to overload it. If you were in a higher light condition, actually it's the downstream efficiency that can be much more important. And it appears that although the photonic structure enhances light capture and light harvesting, it actually becomes a disadvantage when it comes to operating efficiency. <coughs> So, photonic chloroplasts, or iridoplasts, enhance one aspect of photosynthesis, initial light harvesting, but at significant cost. They are less efficient at other aspects of photosynthesis, but this is usually not a problem for most iridescent plants because these are usually deep shade plants. <coughs> so, overall, maybe this isn't the best adaptation, and also, Whereas this makes sense for iridoplasts, it doesn't really explain the multilayers in the cell wall that I sort of sh showed you earlier. But there might be another reason. Iridescence could actually be multifunctional. Many aspects of plants are. Trichomes um, have a huge range of different functions. Um, iridescence could also have a range of other functions as well. It might not just be photosynthesis. Where do we start looking for some of these other functions? Well, could art have the answer? Um, so this goes back a couple of years to a exhibition in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. This is the Fitzwilliam Museum. It's a lovely museum. And they had a wo actually wonderful exhibition there called Endless Forms, where they looked at when Charles Darwin's Origin of Species came out, came out and they looked at the impact that Darwin and his ideas had on artists at the time and how they expressed their reaction to his ideas. And one of the artists that really um, ran with a lot of Darwin's ideas was a chap called Abbott Henderson Thayer, who was an American artist. And he, this particular painting, was in this exhibition in the Fitzwilliam. And I don't know if you can see it, but this is actually a peacock. The painting is called Peacock in the Woods. The peacock is here. And what Abbott Thayer was trying to get at was this idea that a lot of our ideas about why um, organisms might produce particular colours or patterns might not be um, what, only one reason. So what he suggested is that actually the peacock produces this tail not just for a sexual display but actually as a form of camouflage. So he actually went into quite a lot of detail about this. He did a lot of standard art, art as well. But his main, uh, one of his main contributions to an aspect of science um, is a book called Concealing Coloration in the Animal Kingdom. And this book, for this book, he's actually been known as the godfather of camouflage research. Um, and what he actually says in this book, and he has lots of paintings in this book to try and prove his point, is that brilliantly changeable or metallic colours are among the strongest factors in animals' concealment and go far towards achieving obliteration without countershading. Hence, iridescence is, as I have said, one of the prime factors of disguise and quantities of animals profit by it. So what he is suggesting is that structural colour, iridescence, can actually be a form of camouflage. Now, if you've looked at iridescence, that idea is really counterintuitive. Iridescence is usually vivid, uh, it's usually very bright, and this is one of the reasons why we think, for things like peacocks, you know, it's a display. It, it's very easy to see, it's very vivid, it's very colourful. Uh, it's a strong visual signal. 
However, Thayer here, and the painting that I showed you, is suggesting that actually, no, this isn't true, whereas we might think iridescence is vivid and therefore a display, actually it's not, it's camouflage, which is a weird idea. Okay. But, interestingly enough, what you actually find is that quite a few animal species, and I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about animals for a bit, um, they actually do show iridescence, either it's can be very common in monomorphic species, so these are species where both the males and the females look identical, um, and it's also incredibly common in non-reproductive life stages, such as larva, caterpillars, and even chrysalises. So if you've seen some incredibly vivid gold chrysalises, they are like nothing else, and they're really beautiful. And so we came up with the question, okay, iridescence and monomorphism, iridescent, it could it actually function as a weird counterintuitive form of camouflage. So we decided to test it. But that's what, how does camouflage work? Well, there's loads of different ways in which you can use camouflage. You can try and match your background. This is sort of standard um, army issue uh, combat um, camouflage. It tries to blend in with as many backgrounds as possible. So that's background matching. Masquerade, you can pretend to look like something you're not. So here you've got an insect pretending to look like a leaf so that you'll get mistaken for something that you're not. The third type is disruptive coloration. <coughs> um, so this is where you have something so that it disrupts object identity. So if you're trying, if you are a predator and you're looking for the outline pattern of a fish, Having vivid stripes like this breaks up that image so that you can't identify it as easily. So what you're trying to do is either pre prevent detection or prevent recognition. So if you can't detect something, you can't attack it. If you can't recognise quite what it is, you might hesitate before trying to attack it and therefore your prey would then vanish. Okay, so... We decided to test, is iridescence a form of camouflage? And to do this, we used a variety of real and artificial iridescent targets, and we used a variety of different visual systems. We used birds, insects, and human visual systems. And what we can do is we can use behavioural systems to actually get an idea of how effective camouflage can be as a form of... how effective iridescence can be as a form of camouflage. So one thing you can do is you can see how well um, a predator, insect, bird or human takes to actually find a target. So if you put a iridescent disc in the middle of a flight arena full of bees, how long does it take that once this bee has learnt that there is sugar in here to fly from one to three and you can time how long it takes the bee to do that. And what you find is, slightly initially distressingly, is that actually it, take, it can take organisms a lot, uh, lot less time to find iridescence than it does for them to find non-iridescent materials. So here we have the fact that with one form of iridescence, diffraction gratings, it actually took bees and humans much less time to find an iridescent object than it did to find a non-iridescent object. So that sort of rather destroys the whole idea of iridescence as camouflage because actually iridescent objects are easier to find than non-iridescent objects. However, you then have to think about the environment in which this could be happening. So if you are uh, an insect or if you're an iridescent plant, you might not be growing in the sort of standard diffuse light conditions that we usually have in our labs. You might be growing in a dappled light condition. So we tried to actually replicate dappled light using a disco ball, um, which actually worked really well. So here we have our visual setup where we have our um, sort of standard uh, arena for whether it's bees or birds or humans. And here we have our dappled light. As you can see, there are similarities between how dappled the light is. I just it did work. Um, and it is really relevant for particularly iridescent plants because 
as they grow in these deep shade conditions, but where you do get light dappling and, and sun flex coming through, um, so you will get that dappling light effect there too. And what you find, rather interestingly, I think, is that iridescent targets are then less difficult to find under constant light, but more difficult to find under dappled light. So depending on the conditions you're in, iridescence can make a significant difference to how easy you are to find. OK, so that's just finding them. I did also mention the other type of camouflage, which is disruptive coloration. As well as finding an object, can you also recognise it? How does iridescence impact on target recognition? Here, the, actually, the story is a bit simpler. Basically, having iridescence, whether it's a whatever, however you produce that iridescence, you can produce it through diffraction gratings, multi layers, any other form of iridescence. Actually, it works really well to disrupt shape recognition or object identity. So it appears that iridescence can have an effect to act as that disruptive, uh, disruptive coloration form of camouflage. So, did Thayer get it right? Well, partially, looks like yes. And we've done some of these studies now actually out in real-world real world environments with iridescent targets in dappled light conditions in actual woods and actually used wild birds to see what their, their reaction is to iridescent targets. And under sort of entirely natural conditions, yes, iridescence does appear to effect, work quite effectively as a completely counterintuitive form of camouflage. Iridescence may obstruct prey colour recognition, shape recognition and prey detection under some light conditions. And this may explain the widespread occurrence of iridescence <coughs> in, for example, beetles, many, lots of monomorphic animal species. However, does this really explain plant iridescence? So I've now put to you two rather different hypotheses <coughs> as to why some plants are iridescent. I've also shown you that, you know, this iridescence appears to evolve multiple times. It's been, we find it from the lycophytes through the ferns all the way through to monocots and dicots. And does potentially um, camouflage or photosynthesis explain this diversity? So usually when faced with a hypothesis and a plant trait, the standard way of actually answering some of these questions is to do some genetics you knock out the iridescence and then you actually say, OK, I've knocked out the iridescence. Um, has it impacted on photosynthesis? Has it impacted on how well animals can look at this? Does this actually then answer the question, what is the function of iridescence? However, I had a major problem with this. All iridescent plant species we tried were completely genetically recalcitrant. What that means is that they could not be transformed in any way, shape or form. I spent nearly five years trying to transform <coughs> these plants. They're difficult to grow in the first place, they have a tendency to die, and then if you try to get them into tissue culture, they die, and then if you try to <laughs> inoculate them with agrobacteria or biolistics, they die. Um, so general, you know, they were just not amiable to any sort of genetic manipulation. Now, I was coming to the end of the road with this thing, right, fine, we'll just stick with the trying it out with um, sort of biomimetics, replicating the surfaces, trying it out on behavioural and sort of um, modelling what might be happening. But then I started a collaboration with Professor Carmen Gallen over in our School of Chemistry, and we initially started by looking at this plant iridescence as a um, source of inspiration for manipulating lights and uh, manipulating la light in plants via nanomaterials. We found that it could enhance light absorption um, and so we thought, okay, that could be useful for solar panels or the rest of it. Let's use bio-inspired um, materials and see if we can actually enhance photosynthesis further. Now, this isn't an entirely new approach. Uh, nanomaterials have been used before to augment photosynthesis. 
um, a pa paper in um, Nature Materials in 2014 used carbon nanotubes. Now, if you know anything about graphene or anything like that, basically a nanotube is graphene rolled up into a spiky sort of spear that can basically pierce through plant or animal tissues. And what they found here is that, yes, you can get um, uh, nanotubes into plants and it can enhance uh, photosynthesis. So we thought, yay, let's try that. So first of all, we tried something called quantum dots. Um, now, Thermo Fisher describes quantum dots as a truly enabling technology. And you can order these, you can buy them, and you can use them for all sorts of things. You can use them for basically anywhere where you might want to use fluorescence. So anything to do with confocal or fly fluorescence microscopy, you can use the quantum dots instead of a fluorescent uh, protein. Um, and you can use it uh, in Western blotting, cell tracking, all the rest of it. And they say, basically, ideal for experiments requiring long-term photo stability. OK, that sounds useful. Plants need a lot of photo stability. They're sitting in light for a lot of time. What are quantum dots? Well, quantum dots are basically... You have a cadmium core, and then you basically, you can functionalise it with other compounds around that, and it's, um, you can functionalise them in such a way that you can get a range of different colours. Very useful if you're trying to optimise photosynthesis. You can basically absorb light from different wavelengths and see if that will interact with the photosystem. And the synthesis and functionalisation methods are very well established in the literature and relatively straightforward to do. However... There was one slight problem in that, as I said, there's a cadmium core. And so there were a few issues that could that cause some sort of cadmium leaching? It's supposed to be, you know, they're long-term stable. They're not long-term stable in plants. What happens is that after a couple of hours in plants, the photostability breaks down completely and you have a very effective herbicide, which you're basically killing them with cadmium. So... I think that what long-term photostability in something like a western blot or um, <coughs> sort of fluorescence microscopy might be alluding to is very different to long-term photostability where, that you might need in growing plants in sort of 16 hours light for weeks at a time. This was not long-term photostable by any way. So we tried something else. We then tried something called carbon quantum dots. So similar to the quantum dots before, but without a cadmium core. No cadmium, no cadmium leaching, which is a distinct advantage in, from my point of view. <coughs> and the health and safety forms were a lot nicer. Um, they are smaller. They are around 10 nanometers in size. They are inherently fluorescent. So the way that these are made, the structure they have means that these... Um, carbon dots are fluorescent and because they are basically made of burnt sugar they are basically non-toxic and they are photostable so you can get a small amount of these put these under uh, light and you can leave it under continuous light for months at a time and we have done this we did this to check it and they are still fluorescent and they don't seem to degrade um, in any way and like the quantum dots they can also be functionalized by, what I mean by that is that you can get your core carbon dot and you can stick other things round the outside, which will then be linked to this fluorescent um, core in the middle, so you can then track where these things go. So, we've made some carbon dots, found that they were fluorescent, put them into plants, and we found that, yes, you can then... Um, the carbon dots will be taken up by the plant and that you can then image these under a confocal or fluorescent microscope. So this rather beautiful blue here is the fluorescence shown by carbon dots. So you can then actually sort of, you can water on the carbon dots or spray them on or do it in hydroponics and the carbon dots are taken up through multiple routes and you can see that it goes through multiple routes because you can track the fluorescence. 
And that's great. We found that it did enhance photosynthesis, which was wonderful. But it then also raised the other question. Can you also use this to ca carry other molecules? So we know we can functionalise these. Can you actually then use this to take up anything else? Now, this might be useful, not just from my point of view for looking at iridescent plants, but there is currently a bit of a pinch point in some uh, aspects of plant sciences <laughs> going from um, using model species through to actually using crop plants and other non-model species, which is plant transformation. So it's not just my iridescent plants that are difficult. Actually, quite a few species of plants are un untransformable or really difficult to transform. They might take over a year to get from seed to a transformed plant or it's only certain uh, varieties of, for example, soybean. I think there's only two or three varieties of soybean that can be transformed. So plant transformation is <coughs> still a bit of um, a pinch point in the uh, sort of plant biology um, world. So we thought, OK, can we actually use nanomaterials to deliver genetic material into plants? Again, not an entirely new idea. So a paper in Nature Plants out in 2017 um, used clay nanosheets to deliver small chunks of double-stranded RNA into a plant in such a way that <coughs> that double-stranded RNA uh, managed to protect the plant against an invading virus. So you can use the double-stranded RNA to um, act as silencing of the virus when that virus was then used to infect the plant. So the idea that this clay nano sheets actually acted, acted as a reservoir for these small chunks of double-stranded RNA um, that could then, yeah, sort of uh, acted to then silence the virus when it was then infected. Okay, so we thought, right, if you can do that with clay <coughs> nanoparticles, can you then do that with these carbon dots which are act that, that actually are go into the plant, transported throughout the plant, and maybe could carry something with them? like a plasmid carrying a reporter gene, a reporter gene such as yellow fluorescent protein. <coughs> so we first of all, we refunctionalized the carbon dots to see if they could form a nanoplex with the, uh, with the DNA plasmid. That seemed to work quite well. You can then cut a leaf of Arabidopsis and put it into a solution of this carbon dot <coughs> CNA um, nanoplex and because there's a reporter gene you can then follow not just the fluorescence of the carbon dots so you can see if the entire nanoplex is being taken up but also if there is then any expression of the reporter gene and what we found is that yes there was you can basically use this mixture of carbon dots with a plasmid as a sort of transient expression system that once it's into the, which can go into the plant in multiple different ways, it can be sprayed on, or you can take a, a leaf cutting and dunk it into this, into the solution, and it actually um, takes up this nanoplex and you leads to transient expression of whatever reporter gene is on that plasmid. And what was wonderful for me, really wonderful, is that it didn't just work in the standard model crop, model species such as Arabidopsis, it also worked in mature iridescent plants such as Selaginella <coughs> and Begonia. So it works in these really awkward plant species that can't be transformed any other way. So we then decided to take this one step further, and this is where we're sort of at at the moment, and we tried a slightly bigger <coughs> plasmid that actually had the genes required, the machinery required for gene editing. So this was a plasmid that had all the machinery required for gene editing, including the guide RNA complex, the, the um, CRISPR complex as well. And you can actually use the nanoplex of that plasmid to take it into uh, a crop plant wheat. And the machinery is actually linked to nuclear targeted GFP. So you can sort of um, spray on this nanoplex and then you can actually track to see whether the plasmid has been taken up and expressed, and you can sort of see that by seeing this punctate glowing nuclear pattern, which you don't get in the control. And what you then find is that if you then see whether the machinery is active, you can do that using PCR to see if there's any been any gene editing. 
So you can sort of spray on gene editing and actually see <coughs> if not only the machinery, the GFP and the machinery is expressed, but if it then actually works within the plant cell. And it appears to work not particularly well. Um, it's very low expressed pattern. So this is a standard protoplast transformation. This is the standard gene and this is the edited version of it. This is the one using the, the um, nanoplex. And here you see a very low copy number. So very relatively few cells have had that gene edit occur. But when we sequenced that rather well, feeble band there, we found that yes, the gene edit had happened and that um, the machinery had in at least some cells been active and worked. So what we've got is a system that seems to work on mature plants that you can then use either to um, express reporter genes or potentially edit out other things just to try out what genes do, which for me is ideal. I can start targeting the genes that I want to see, that I suspect might be involved for iridescence, and actually see if that is the case. So, yes, we've developed a, plant trans a transient plant transformation system using these, this nano um, technology to carry plant expression plasmids into plant cells. And you can use this for uh, spray on gene editing as well as for reporter genes. And what we're currently doing at the moment is trying to use that technology to actually test out some of our candidate genes for plant iridescence so we can then see to what extent it impacts on photosynthesis, on um, potential herbivore behaviour, and actually see where our hypotheses on iridescence actually end up. Now, this work involved a whole range of different people. It's involved physicists, chemists. Um, this was definitely not just me. So these are the people that did a lot of the plant iridescence work. Um, this is uh, Martin Lopez Garcia, who's just got his faculty position over in Portugal, <coughs> and Professor Ruth Alton. And these are members of my group who've done a lot on iridescent plants. Um, these are the camouflage people. So Professor Innes Cuthill and Professor Nick Scott Samuel are sort of psychologists and animal biologists. Um, uh, and then Karin and Joe have actually done a lot of the work on actually testing out iridescence as camouflage. And then these are the people who've been working on the nanoplex side of things um, and the carbon dots. This is <coughs> Professor Carmen Gallen, who has been, who's, who's the synthetic chemist that I, I collaborate with. And so none of this work would have been at all possible without a wide range of collaborators in an incredibly diverse range of fields. And thank you very much for listening.